court in a five to four ruling upheld President Donald Trump's restriction on travel to the United States from a handful of Muslim majority countries on Tuesday, giving the White House its first high court victory on the merits of a presidential initiative. Chief Justice John Roberts, writing for the majority, made it clear that the court viewed the ability to regulate immigration as squarely within the president's powers, and he rejected critics' claim of anti-Muslim bias. We express no view on the soundness of the policy, Roberts wrote. In other words, now they're not making a value judgment as to whether or not the policy is good. They're just saying that this is, in fact, something that the president gets to do. After a series of federal court rulings invalidated or scaled back earlier versions of the travel ban, the decision is a big win for the administration and ends 15 months of legal battles over a key part of Trump's immigration policy, which opponents attacked as a dressed-up form of the Muslim ban that Trump promised during his 2016 campaign. Closing argument, my name is Walter Hudson. Twin Cities News Talk, AM 1130, 103.5 FM, 651-989-5855, the number to join us. That story comes to us from NBC News. We have in studio with us uh, Steve Carlson, a candidate for U.S. Senate, uh, running as a Democrat who happens to have views on immigration that are much more in line with uh, the President of the United States, Donald Trump, than you might expect from somebody who's running for office as a Democrat. Your reaction, Mr. Carlson, to this ruling by the Supreme Court? Well, I think um, it was pretty much a non-ruling. As you say, they didn't uh, pass on the policy. They shouldn't pass on the policy. Now, if you look at how this all started, one Sally Q. Yates, who was uh, let go, I guess, by the city of Minneapolis this this, uh, week, they were going to have her study ketamine, I think, and, and that was stopped, and I'm glad. But she actually when she took over as the attorney general, uh, directed attorneys for the Department of Justice not to appear, not to defend that executive order. And I thought that was atrocious because I think they are for national security. Uh, And this is a big problem that I see with a lot of attorneys general where they're being very selective on what they're gonna do. Um, I never thought this was a Muslim ban and it isn't a Muslim ban. The problem that we have is that uh, people uh, are trying to get into the country for the wrong reasons. And I think that we need a president who focuses on that because we have to stop What, what would you characterize as a wrong reason for wanting to get in the country? Basically, uh, uh, because of uh, ideology that they want to carry out violence or overthrow the government. And because uh, part of it is growing out of the war. Um, possibly, you know, famine, refugee situations, the very bad situations that we need to uh, look at and help and, and help them on the ground there. Uh, third countries uh, working on, on the ground with NGOs and things like this, trying to bring peace and I think work internationally. So really we need to solve the situation. But until that time, we have a lot of people that are going to Europe and coming to the United States to carry out uh, violence. I mean, we had a person and people might say he snapped, but he stabbed 11 people in He's Saint, the Saint Cloud. Yeah, in Saint Cloud, yeah. and, and it's it's ridiculous to have a governor that says that if you don't like it, you should leave the state, and that is because because yeah. of your behavior. I mean, and so this first judge uh, who did this out in Washington was obviously uh, ridiculous. He said, "Well, I know exactly why you're doing this. This is a very sound principle." I talked about this, by the way. I ran for president as, as well in, in, as independent uh, beginning in 2015, which is how I spotted Trump. Mm-hmm. And I saw that this is a very, very smart man. And um, the problem that we all saw then was especially the persecution of, of Christians. Okay. I mean, I never saw anything. I are, couldn't, you talking, are you talking about domestically or overseas? Uh, overseas. Okay. The, this is where we don't want the people coming from. And so what they would do, I'm talking about people who were killing off these Christians. Uh-huh. Uh, it was, and some Muslims too, they were slaughtering some Muslims, Kurds, they were all targets. Uh, and this was this so-called ISIS thing. And uh, and Donald Trump says, we can't, we have to help these Christians to get away from this because they're being persecuted because they're Christians. And so people said, oh, that's a religious test. Well, no, it isn't. The religious test was they were being targeted uh, and, and killed, you know, they Kids were killed, wives were there, you know, the, the usual uh, uh, burning and pillaging kind of thing. And um, 
I'm glad that we have to that we started to vet for that. And I believe that some of those countries have been taken out of that status already, and the vetting is working. And I think it's going to go on to work. I think Donald Trump has made it very clear he's not anti-Muslim. Okay, he we all recognize that there are a lot of people who are abhorred by this, and very often they're the target of it too. Uh, but it is apparently part of the Quran and some of the other uh, religious writings that you're supposed to kill people of other religions, exactly what Benton Carson would say. I wanna, I, I, so we have to we, vet. We need to go to a break, yes, but I, when we come back, I want to get into, because we're kind of starting to conflate immigration with the question of Islam itself. And I understand that they're they're related in this instance with the travel ban. Right. But I want to I wanna go a little bit more into detail regarding some of the underlying legal and moral arguments surrounding the travel ban. And then we maybe we can transition in to talk more about the, the Islam stuff as well. Steve Carlson, candidate for U.S. Senate, running as a Democrat, in studio with us tonight. My name is Walter Hudson. Closing argument, 651-989-5855, Twin Cities News Talk, AM 1130, 1035 FM, TwinCitiesNewsTalk.com. I hope I don't sound too harsh, you know, but um, I really am not. I don't actually think it is anti-Muslim. I think it's a law and order and what we should have been doing. Yeah, I have a, a video that I've re-edited and I put it out there. It's one that's got the most views. It's about the problem of, of Islam and persecution and Obama's strategies and the kinds of things that Ben Carson was talking about that would he have put in a Muslim for president in 2016 and his personal reasons why. He didn't think for the office of president that would be appropriate, but he said for Congress, you know, uh, there would be more leeway because there wasn't as much power, you know, mm-hmm. and that caused this whole big debate with him and, and Trump got into it and I got into it too, but see, I got the most votes for, I mean, I, I won the primary for the Senate in 2014. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and so that was at the top of the ballot. So I felt that after we got smashed, which is another, Thing I wasn't able to get into because it's real complicated. But Al Franken, you know, and, and Dayton, they totally eliminate us from debates, the Independence Party. And the reason you got Bob Anderson, because he went with the, Demo- with the Republicans, and I'm, I went with the Democrats. And I, uh, I suggested to him that we should have a debate sometime where we, we, we discuss which way independence should go with the Republicans or Democrats. And I think I can make a very good case why it should be the Democrats. For one thing, the Democrat Party has to change. It has to change a lot. You didn't know about these quotas. Oh, yeah. I couldn't believe it that people were doing this. This happened when I was over in the Vietnam era, you know, when I was overseas. In the, I wasn't actually in Vietnam, but I flew combat support, you know, for, as a linguist, Vietnamese linguist. And, uh, and back here, Fraser and McGovern and... Mondale and Humphrey were creating these quotas that were carving out white males from the government. Mm -hmm. And because they're supposed to, all the other people are supposed to have a history of oppression and uh, exclusion. Therefore, it's your turn to sit on the sidelines. And so if you look at what's happening in the Democratic Party, this is a national rule. This is a DNC rule. And I've, in my video about the, because the Muslims have a quota. And that's why they're skyrocketing. I mean, you look at, at, at uh, the Phyllis Khan district, it wasn't just the district, it was also the quota. They have a quota at every level. And so it's, it's terrible. Oh, yeah. Another okay. Minute or so. I'm glad you watched this because yeah. music is cool, you know, the sound. That's why I would listen to it. You know, it fills your car with like, you know. It's really happening all the time. You know? <laughs> it's like a drug. You know? I don't actually listen to it very much. Yeah. But I, I enjoy it. Sure. Not all talk radio is worth listening to. That's yeah. one thing. In fact, I don't have a movie about it, you know, which seriously puts the subject to rest. <laughs> Why would anybody watch talk radio?
Oh, wow. She's like a socialist or something, isn't she? DSA or something, you know? I haven't been following that stuff too closely. I just see it go by quickly on Twitter because I follow like 5,000 people. All right, okay. All right. In studio with us tonight, we have Steve Carlson, candidate for the U.S. Senate, seeking the seat currently held by Amy Klobuchar. He's running as a Democrat, but uh, certainly the most unconventional senatorial candidate from the Democratic Party that I've ever encountered. He's a fan of Donald Trump, and he holds positions that many of you may hold as well on issues like immigration and tariffs and the views regarding the threat of Islam and Sharia law and what have you. And we're getting into all of that here tonight on Closing Argument. My name is Walter Hudson, Twitsies News Talk, AM 1130, 103.5 FM. You can catch us streaming at twitsiesnewstalk.com and on your iHeartRadio app. We're here 9 to 11 weeknights. 651-989-5855 is the number to join us this evening. Brad Homer introducing the show. Taking your calls. We got Barry on the line in St. Paul. He's got a question for... Steve Carlson, welcome to the program. Okay, thanks, uh, Barry, for that question. Well, um, first of all, I have a lot of parliamentary experience. Okay, I mean, like I know Robert's Rules of Order, and I get in there and I get a lot of motions passed, and I get a lot of things done. Now, obviously, when you get into the c Congress, they have different rules, um, but they're essentially uh, the same. Now, as far as the Senate goes, they're the deliberative body. They very often have a sixty uh, vote. Uh, requirement. And so what you have to do is uh, listen. And I really can listen. I, I listen to what, what you said, but um, I don't know if Amy Klobuchar was really a blue dog Democrat or not, because I can't really detect uh, any values from her. And I, I don't want to just go off on her in answering a question, but to me, she's pretty much like, I would call her a, a wallflower. Uh, she doesn't really do anything. She has these little projects, which every once in a while she puts in the in the papers. But let's take let's take one of those. And I want to go off on too much of a tangent, but let me just give you an example of cancer. Okay. Now my my wife uh, has had breast cancer, and she's been part of this program, which is a federal program, in which the treatment is supposed to be paid for if you're diagnosed under that program. Well. Um, so that program, the state of Minnesota and Amy Klobuchar is going along with this. They're throwing her off two years before her cancer treatment was completed, and they're throwing hundreds of Minnesota women off. Now, I don't even think that Amy Klobuchar gets it, what this is about. I mean, this is breast cancer. Now, on the other hand, look at one of her projects. What does she do about cancer? Well, she has a registry for firemen who, yes, firemen get cancer. It is terrible. But it's going to be really terrible when it turns out just like it did for the women that were being screened in the 1990 Act, where they just screened them and they watched them die because there was no help available for them to get treatment. And there isn't help available for these firemen either. So she's just trying to do basically nothing. And I am going to work across, I know Al says he worked across the aisle, but I actually do. I have a very good track record. People used to ask me, they read about what I was doing in Minnesota Daily. They say, why are you uh, 
why are you defending uh, the the option of students to opt out of paying for MPERG? I mean, weren't you on MPERG? Uh, isn't that a conservative position? Well, yes, but if if freedom of uh, the freedom of the students to not be forced to participate in MPERG, that's something I want to talk with everybody about, and we solved that issue. I thought. Uh -huh. Right. Well, I, I don't, I don't back Chuck Schumer as the uh, minority leader. Uh, what I have seen Amy Klobuchar do is stand up besides Chuck Schumer, while they were shutting down the government. Now she she wasn't doing it on a blue dog thing. She she did it because supposedly they weren't going to solve the DACA issue, and so she voted against a continuing resolution to allow the government to continue. And I have a picture of that on my Twitter feed, which is Steve uh, W. Carlson. I appreciate the call, Barry. I'll try to, to follow up here for you. I, Thank you. I think what Barry's getting after sure. is that. I, I think you've established well that you'll be an independent voice. Like, I don't picture somebody pushing you around, a whip coming along and saying, you're going to go this way, and you actually being like, okay. Like, that, I don't see that in your character, your personality. But to Barry's point, mm -hmm. there is this question of what it's like to caucus with a party, and you're running as a Democrat. And if they want to, they can shut you out of everything. They can shut you, assuming that they're, you know, they have the, the majority or whatever, they, they have the control. They can shut you out of the committees. They can shut you out of being able to have much impact or much of a say. So are you effectively running just to kind of be an insurgent voice, or are, do you do you hope to be able to actually accomplish something? I know I can. <clears throat> the power lies with the people. It, it always has. It, it always does. And so we need to address these issues. We have issues like immigration that needs to be solved take, take take for instance the the children that have been separated from their parents well why is that happening it's because amy klobuchar and the rest of the democrats first they won't do anything now to allow them to be united and not be shut out by that 20-day limit that comes from this court case flores mm -hmm. versus reno yeah. but uh at the same time who started this and I have, I have a video that's, that's about the Wilberforce Amendment. Wilberforce Amendment is about human trafficking. And it says that the government is supposed to take these young girls, who they said 80% of them say they've been sexually assaulted when they get in the United States, and meet with them and see if they really have been, and if they have been, to follow up on that okay. and to protect them. And if they haven't been, they're going to repatriate them not back to the other side of the border where they probably will be trafficked, mm -hmm. okay, but back to their countries of origin. Now, I brought that up under Obama. Now, Obama, after the election, he gives all this discretionary authority to prosecutors. And I think they're just, I know some of those girls got put in a, in a case in, in Ohio where they were put, they're actually slave labor. And they, I, I understand yeah. the argument that you're making. Yeah. What I'm suggesting and what I think Barry's okay. suggesting is that having the correct argument isn't going to advance policy. The, that the institutional reality is you have to actually have the the political support amongst your caucus and the and frankly the consent of your leadership in order to be able to do anything. Well, you know, I don't mean to be disrespectful to the institution at all, but I will want support from Donald Trump. I will want support from moderate. Republicans and moderate Democrats, the true blue dog approach. I want to work with them. I want to solve these problems. And as we go through each of my issues, I think you'll find I actually have solutions. I actually understand what the hangups are. And uh, I want to say one more thing, and that is that, you know, self-governance has always been limited. You know, our colonies just sort of gave, delegated self-governance to people to solve issues. So that they could be productive. They weren't. It's not some philosophy class, you know, where everybody has to agree. It's things have to get done. Governance has to proceed so that we can have a successful country. All right, let's let's explore one of those issues. Sure. We're, we're running short on time before we have to go to another break, but I want to get back into the Supreme Court decision upholding President Donald Trump's travel ban and the broader implications of that. From the Star Tribune, hours after the Supreme Court upheld that ban, Muslim community leaders 
immigration attorneys and advocates from around the Twin Cities decried the decision, saying they fear it will prompt broader immigration restrictions and amplify discrimination against Minnesota's growing Muslim community. And uh, they, they go on to talk about a co news conference that was held by CARE, who I know you're familiar with, the Council on American Islamic Relations and what have you. And you know, basically the argument that they're making, the argument that I'm hearing from the left today is that, you know, they're, it's very fascinating to me because they're evoking all these past decisions that the court has made to uphold horrible things like slavery and Jim Crow and, and similar uh, moral atrocities and saying, we've been in this position before where the Supreme Court has failed to take the, the right and proper decision. And that, of course, is complete hogwash comparing this to that. There's no comparison whatsoever. However, where I agree with them is in the underlying sentiment that there is a difference between what is legal and what is moral. And so we find ourselves in a, in a situation where, you know, I think the court ruled correctly in this in this instance in that they interpreted the law as it's written they interpreted the constitution as it's written and said this is this is consistent with the powers that the president's supposed to have under the current law under current president under our reading of the constitution but the le the, the legal question being resolved in that matter says nothing about the underlying moral question and that's what i'm interested in in and unfortunately i'm you're gonna have to make it quick and then we can come back to it after the break but I'm interested in this moral question of what it means to have rights. Because you know, a lot of the arguments that I hear from people who are hardcore on immigration, hardliners on immigration, is well, the Constitution doesn't apply to, to non-citizens, it doesn't apply to, to aliens, it certainly doesn't apply to illegal aliens. So you can't cite your constitutional rights when you're coming here from somewhere else. But don't these rights that we refer to that are referenced in the Constitution, don't those rights pre-exist the state? Don't they pre-exist the Constitution? Aren't they inherent in the fact that a human being exists as such? How then can it be truthfully said that somebody who's not from here doesn't have those rights? And of course, they do have the rights, and the Constitution is the greatest thing. And as they learn the Constitution, they're going to benefit greatly. This is the same argument that we brought up with Ben Carson and Donald Trump when I was running in 2015. Uh, for the independence uh, as a candidate for president. And that is that you have to comply with the Constitution. Like the your earlier caller said, once you abide by those rules, you have so much freedom and so much liberty, you're going to love it. You're not going to have to adhere to something that is inimical, that views as an enemy, this Christian-based Constitution, which is basically based on grace and compassion and rejects the you know the the workings of strict law that somebody can get a hold of and do injustice to you so this is something that's going to allow you freedom we have to tone down the rhetoric we're in a 24 7 news cycle and people actually believe some people they're actually convinced by what the fake news says it's not true there's no reason to panic and it's a time for dialogue and i don't think trump is going to take any actions against muslims i don't like I say, he's trying to just screen out the kind of people who are going to be doing harm to to everybody, including those Muslims. Steve Carlson, candidate for U.S. Senate running as a Democrat. My name is Walter Hudson. Closing argument, 651-989-5855, TwinCitiesNewsTalk.com. That name always makes me think I got like five minutes left for a closing statement. <laughs> you know, because you hear it in courts, you know. Good questions. I, I've actually thought about these. That's why I find them really interesting. I actually am kind of, a, I'm both liberal and conservative, but I'm very liberal. But you want to help people. You don't want to just give people answers that are false and are not going to go anywhere. And the Constitution really is good, but it hasn't really been set out by the courts. I mean, Look at, like Claire Thomas said, you know, how these natural rights that you're talking about, how can you have slavery under the Constitution? And how can you not enforce the Constitution um, for things that you attribute to the states, only for federal rights that don't exist? You know, and apparently there was no federal right not to be a slave. You know, if the states decided you were property, you were property, you know. And that's the problem with the law, you know. They use it. They pick it up and use it to hurt people. 
I enjoy the discussion, as you can see. I like to hear people's point of views, but I like to answer, you know, the issues that can be answered. Where is Good Feet anyway? I got to get some of that stuff. I have a standing job on, you know, part time. I'm more of a Democrat than these guys are. I really am. Once you strip everything away, these issues are really hard. They're complicated. They can be solved. Where'd you go to college? Uh, University of Phoenix. I got a degree. Oh, you told me. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's right, in computer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was at the university because uh, I wanted to go to the battleground of ideas. I had good enough scores that I could have got into, you know. I had I turned down a scholarship for music, and I could have got into, you know, really good schools. But I thought that was the best because that's where the ideas, you know, of the war, Vietnam War, civil rights, uh, especially those two, those, they were being hammered out there, and I wanted to go and be a part of it back in 69. like almost 50 years ago. Can you believe it? But I was a Vietnamese linguist. I had to be vetted by the CIA and the FBI to get a top secret security clearance. They got close to the war, you know. So I guess I am a little conservative and liberal at the same time. You know? Believe in national security. When I came back from that war wanting change, you know, and wanting to address problems of racism, exclusion, because I'd seen them in action in the war, <laughs> what they amounted to, you know, what it came to. So I would like to debate Amy Klobuchar I asked her to. I don't think she's going to agree. She's never agreed to debate anybody. She's the expert at avoiding debates. I find it humorous that she was viewed as a blue dog. She's just a prosecutor, you know. That's all she knows. I don't dislike her as a person. I hope it doesn't come across like that. How many people do you think uh, listen to your show? I have no idea. Good. None. It varies, I'm sure, too. Yeah, I mean, you know, I've tried to extrapolate based on, like, the station's overall rating. And, but you just don't know. You know, could be 60,000, could be 80,000. It's great. That's great. 60, 80,000 thinking people. That's what we need. Maybe. Yeah. You can do a lot. I don't know. Good way to spend your spare time in the evenings. Yeah, it's fun. I enjoy it at least. I mean them. Twin Cities News Talk, AM 1130, 103.5 FM. Closing argument. My name is Walter Hudson. 651-989-5855, the number to join us this evening. In studio, we have Steve Carlson, a candidate for U.S. Senate, running as a Democrat. But he's not like any Democrat you've encountered before. He's a fan of President Donald Trump, and he holds a lot of positions on issues that uh, you would more commonly associate with conservatives or Republicans, particularly issues like immigration, uh, tariffs, nowadays tariffs. Republicans used to have a different position on tariffs just a couple of years ago, but that's apparently flipped now that we have Donald Trump as the standard bearer of the party. We'll get into that next hour. Right now, I want to focus a little bit more on, on uh, immigration 
as such. There's, of course, a story here out of Reuters. We talked about this a little bit yesterday. Parents who cross illegally from Mexico to the United States with their children will not face prosecution for the time being because the government is running short of space to house them, officials said on Monday. So it's it's an interesting situation where, you know, Trump initiated this zero tolerance policy at the border where we're going to prosecute any adult who illegally crosses and, you know, take them through the whole process. And that triggered this 1997 decree that we referenced earlier, whereby children who can't be detained more than 20 days by the government, they have to be shifted into, you know, some sort of alternative custody. And that was the dreaded separation of families. And so in order to address that, the president signed this executive order, basically directing his lawyers to seek a judicial remedy to that. And now in the aftermath of that executive order, it's they're, they're basically admitting, listen, we don't have the capacity to do this. Like we don't have the resources available to prosecute everyone and detain everyone and detain their families. What's your view, first of all, on you know the, this particular situation where do, do we need to engage in massive construction efforts? Do we need to build you know twice as many detention centers in order to hold all these these families? Or is there something more fundamental wrong with the status quo of immigration policy that needs to change? Okay, well, we do need a massive construction uh, effort to build the wall. And as we build the wall, they're going to see that we're not just trying to keep people out. We're trying to build a safe, secure area where people from both sides of the border can live and, and have a, a, a good, re, good neighbor relations that were envisioned under the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which in eight, 1848 created that wall. Now, as far as this situation, I don't agree that uh, they're admitting they don't have the resources. Well, I mean, that's literally what they've said. Uh, well, not really, because I think you need to look behind it. You, you mentioned that they're supposed to seek a judicial remedy, right? Well, that's going to require the filing of a lawsuit. So as I see it, they're probably going to pick out a case that they can bring to the Supreme Court that is exemplary of the rest of what they're trying to do and, and win that case. Uh, they're also trying to get Amy Klobuchar, Tina Smith, all the rest to vote to extend that 20-day limit. And now you're starting to hear arguments, oh, you can't do that because now we're condemning children to indefinite uh, incarceration. So you can't win no matter what you do. But I, I do think that we can uh, go past 20 days. Um, we, I agree with what Trump is doing now. I said this, and this is what the Wilberforce Amendment did. It, it screened people to see, do you have any credible case, any scenario in which you could stay in this country? And if the answer is no, then no, you don't need to see a judge. Because what judges do is they look at questions of law and they shouldn't have to deal with questions of fact. Those should be able to be dealt with in an administrative hearing. I mean, that's not always the way you want to do it, but very often, You'd, like if uh, we have a law in, in Minnesota that you can't discuss the Constitution when you're in an administrative hearing for the Department of Health uh, of Human Services. This, you get your cancer treatment taken away with no discussion. You can't say it's unconstitutional. So just because you cross the border doesn't mean you need to have a long, dragged out, you know, months long with every lawyer that wants a job to come in and make things up. So like Trump is saying, well, hey, if we're very sorry but we have laws and you don't qualify, I think they should repatriate them back to their country of origin. They shouldn't just kick them across the border, Mexican border. And, and this is very humane. And once it's done, people will, will stop this. Now, there are big problems in those countries and we need to help with that. Sarah Huckabee Sanders, the press secretary for the White House said, according to Reuters, this will only last a short amount of time because we're going to run out of space we're going right. to run out of resources in order to keep people together. And we're asking Congress to provide those resources and do their job. So that's the admission from the White House right. that they are, in fact, running out of resources. And, you know, whatever the, the legislative solution to that may be, we know how slowly the gears of legislative, you know, undergoings take. I, I think the courts will move faster. I think they can get this into the courts when they have the right case. Steve Carlson, candidate for U.S. Senate, in studio with us. Closing argument. My name is Walter Hudson, TwinCitiesNewsTalk.com.
right, this is the long break. So if you want to use the restroom. Oh, great. I was going to ask. <laughs> no, okay. that's great. Thanks. Are you like a philosophy student? <laughs> Again, as a layman, yes. <laughs> oh, okay. Whoa. Well, that's probably yeah. That's a... And you got this mastered. Wow. It flows, you know, it flows real good. It flows a lot better than a lot of the talk shows I see on Sunday morning. Sure. We're back.
We've spent the first hour getting to know Steve Carlson, who's a candidate for U.S. Senate, running as a Democrat, who holds the interesting distinction of being a fan of Donald Trump, the current Republican president in the United States, and holding many positions that are in sync with the sitting president. My name is Walter Weston, which is in stock, in one FM closing argument. We stream on TwinCitiesNewsTalk.com and the iHeartRadio app. We're here 9 to 11 weeknights. Appreciate you joining us. 651-989-5855 is the number to contribute to the program. Brad Omlin taking those calls and producing the show. All right. I want to get into some of the the controversies potentially that uh, can emerge between this. This whole thing started, you know, the reason we had me in the program was over a disagreement on tariffs, and we'll get to that eventually, but I want to stick with immigration here for a sec. And I, I want to throw a couple of premises at you and see how you respond to them. The first one is you know, regarding the the issue of the border itself. We commonly hear it described uh, in the, the debate about illegal immigration. We commonly hear language that describes the border, like the existence of the border, as being dependent upon enforcement of immigration law. You know, you'll, you'll hear terms like, you know, the border means something, and Trump said this during the campaign, the border means something, and in order for it to mean something, we have to enforce our laws, we have to enforce immigration. And you hear rhetoric along the lines of the, the, the Democrats and the leftists and the open borders crowd are trying to destroy the border. You hear terminology like anarchy at the border and things of this nature. We have all kinds of political borders within the United States of America. There are borders between municipalities, cities, counties, political districts, school districts, legislative districts. And people cross these borders, these lines on maps, every day, all the time, without chaos, without anarchy. What fundamentally is different about the national border that requires these types of restrictions about who's crossing in and under what circumstances. Uh, so I guess you're distinguishing not between the four sides of our national borders, but between national borders and other kinds of borders. What, what's special about a national border that requires control over how and when it's crossed? Well, okay, because uh, with our constitution, all right, we're all part of the government. We all have rights as citizens. And so one of the things that's happening now is that that's being diluted. And citizens feel that, you know, they're, they're second place, that other people are being helped by our public policy and not them. And, you know, people say, well, this is, a, you know, the country was based on immigrants, it's made up of immigrants, right. but it's made up of citizens. And there are a lot of people who see this and say, wait a minute, it's not made up of immigrants. They might once have been immigrants, but now they're citizens. And if you want to be a citizen, you should go through the proper process because citizens are important because the society is important. Uh, we have voting. The voting rights can't, you have non-citizens that are trying to vote in certain elections like educational school board or something like this. There may be a role, you know, a, a role that the citizens can can do in these these places, but it should the, it should reside with the citizens to make the decisions to govern uh, the country, and then we can expand that to other people. Now, at the border, the open border policy it, it truly does destroy the border. I saw somebody somebody was arguing with me on, online uh, over the weekend that uh, is it's just everybody is kind of. I think it was supposed to be a libertarian argument. You know, uh, a person has absolute right to cross the border whenever he wants. Well, if that was true, then we could have the people that you're fleeing for your asylum, they can cross the border. You know, how can we stop them? You know, so there wouldn't be any asylum. It would be blown out of the water. So asylum and all of these other compassionate policies and great programs that 
our country is based on, they have to be based on on citizens. You know, in Minnesota, we used to have uh, white citizens was in our constitution. It had to be removed after the Civil War, but it, the, the the circumstances were the Indians, the Ojibwe and the and the Dakota weren't. Uh, allowed to vote, they were seen as having their own sovereign nations, mm-hmm. and and so they, that was put in there. And so from the very beginning, in our naturalization, we had to control who was creating this great country. Other people could. Isn't be, there a distinction, however, even historically, between mm-hmm. the process of naturalization and immigration? Because it occurs to me, and perhaps I just don't know my history well enough. Okay. But it occurs to me that the, the concept of, of heavy immigration restrictions and monitoring the border was not a founding concept of the United States. That naturalization, which is the process by which somebody becomes a citizen, was, mm-hmm. of course, and properly should be, I think, and that's where the, the right to vote comes into play and right. the, the privileges that come with citizenship and what have you. But the, the mere crossing of a line on the map in order to to reside here and work here and engage in relationships and trade was not something that the the founding fathers were particularly occupied with. And if we look at the Mexican border, like personally, I am very much in favor of just human relations with everybody. And that's what I see. My grandfather... Over a wall. My my grandfather... Well, a a wall doesn't need to uh, separate. It can protect assets that are of common value to everybody. I mean, we're, we got so four you, walls around this room. You would, <laughs> you, know. you, would, you would compare, you, so you would compare it, this is what I'm hearing, and you yeah. tell me if I'm wrong. You would compare it to like a fence between neighbors, right? Where, where just like, if I, if I erect I a problem. fence on my property mm-hmm. line, mm-hmm. it's not because I hate my neighbor, exactly. it's just because I want to be able to delineate between what's mine and what's his. Well, even more to the point is so each of you can have your own private property, and that's what our society is based on. Now, I think one of the problems that's happening now is people do get upset about the employment situation. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of our people, obviously, they like to have these people come in and work. And Trump, from the very beginning, has said, I'm going to let all the good people come back. And he, he got trouble from Pe- Ted Cruz about that. You know, things have evolved. But he recognizes the contributions that the immigrants make, even the illegal immigrants. And this is a good thing. But we've got to secure that border because that's not going to work. You know, Farmer Jones having someone pick his crop at a certain time on the season is great. But it's not going to work if we keep having people flooding across that because they're not picking the crops for Farmer Jones. And they're just trying to get a, a better life, which we want. We, but I think they could have a better life in Mexico. We should, they should. And that's what I'm saying. If we, my, my goal, and I've had this since 2000. 10 is the first thing that I addressed was the Arizona situation and the border wall. Wow. And it is this, that everybody is a human being and has to make a living and has to make it pay. They got to get a job and they make it pay all of us from whatever country. However, uh, what, what Trump is saying, and I agree is, and, and Congress has agreed is we need to secure the border. And because otherwise it just doesn't work and people come in, uh, to take jobs and then to run past, uh, to do things now that they're, they're running. So many people are running drugs. Everybody's not running drugs, but we can't protect ourselves against criminal elements, nor can the Mexican immigrants themselves protect themselves when there's no order and there's just chaos. All right. So let me, that leads perfectly into another premise that I want to th- throw your way and, and have you react to. Okay. I have this sense, and it's admittedly a project under development in terms of this this philosophical concept that part of the pro- many of the problems that we attribute to immigration and you just cited you know the the rise of the cartels that's implicit in what you said the the drug trade employment uh, the, the, the employment's one thing um, the human trafficking is another All of these things, to my mind, are products of black markets, which we've created with our own policy. By having the drug war, by making it illegal to engage in certain transactions, by having heavy immigration restrictions that creates a black market for the trafficking of human beings across the border, we've effectively created this pocket of anarchy in which government, by its own choice, does not exist. 
And when you have a, circ a, a situation like that, where people can't go to an institutional authority to resolve their complaints against their coyote or against their drug dealer or whatever the case may be, then it, it, it becomes a, a scenario where might makes right and it's the rule of the brute. And that's that translates into all this violence that's often attributed to the border. Is there is there a connection there between the policies that we've adopted in, in terms of what domestically with the drug war and these immigration restrictions and the violence that we've seen as a result emerging out of these cartels and whatnot? Well, I think there is a policy problem, but it doesn't come from our side. It comes from the Mexican side. As I mentioned, I mean, one of the popes, one of the early popes gave the entire Western hemisphere to Spain, to the Spanish king. And that claim has been exerted all the way up to Minnesota. This used to belong to Spain before the uh, Louisiana Purchase. And it, it's ridiculous. And, and so, uh, but the reality is that Mexicans have been highly concentrated in the Mexico City area. I mean, it's the largest city in the hemisphere always has. I think it's 30 million right now. It dwarfs any of our cities. And they don't care about the border. They're making a lot of money down there. They're very talented people. They got engineering. They, uh, they, they invented the zero. Um, All that may be true. The, but mm -hmm. the point that I'm driving at yeah. here is that if you go and you talk to, and there's a documentary you can find on social media called yeah. The Wall that deals with that interviews ranchers who actually live down there. Right. And they'll tell you from their 40, 50, 60 years of experience living on the border that illegal immigration has increased exponentially. And they don't draw the connection, but the connection that I see is that it has increased right alongside the, the advent and expansion of the drug war and increases in immigration enforcement, which have created these black markets that suck people in. Now, the other side of that, I will grant you, okay. which you've also addressed, is the, the, the welfare state and the, the economic draw of being able to come here for, for opportunity. So it's a multifaceted issue. Well, I, I, I'm not so much into that. What I'm saying is that they're not doing anything else with the border. Now, I talked with a Mexican man about my idea of the border states working together, including 10 Mexican border states south of the border. And he says they simply can't control the situation. There's been no development there, so it's wide open for drugs. We need a program where we show the people they can do other things and raise illegal drugs or traffic in illegal drugs, like we had in Afghanistan. So people can live safely because everybody's living in, in, half of these people are running away from that situation. Right. I was one of the early people who said, you know, there could be an asylum issue if they're shooting everybody and you're scared for your life. You know, there is one, but it's not one that we're recognizing right now. The, the other thing we can do is work bilaterally, which I have suggested since 2010, in the area of human rights and security. So we're cooperating with the Mexican government, whether it's those 10 states or with the support of Mexico City, to keep that area safe. I don't see why... Does Mexico have any interest in doing that? The 10 governors do. Many Well, how many people got killed in the Mexican election so far? 120 people is the latest figure I heard. They're candidates, and they're killed in the election because they're trying to address uh, this situation. By the cartel. Well, by people who don't want them to have a normal development on the border, cooperating with the United States. So we need someone in, in the, as a president of Mexico, whether it's Obrador or whether it's someone else, who's going to work with us as human beings, not to demonize us, not to demonize Donald Trump, but to say, yeah, we're all human beings, we're all one, and let's get along. Let's get along. And if we build a strong border with security, but also community, okay, with safety and security for everybody, people will want to go there because it could add to our gross domestic product because we, we can make things. We, we can make cars, for instance, where we make the, car, the body of the car on this side of the border. We have an integration where, with, with parts being outsourced to Mexican companies. And people can come there and, and create jobs. I'm, I'm it can there, be GM. I find myself really confused by what you're proposing because on the one hand it sounds very much like free market mutually beneficial relationships and transactions right but taking place across a 10 to 12 foot wall 
that people can't it doesn't, cross. You know, I mean, the wall isn't just the places that you don't have a city. We have walls, you know, there's like pairs of U.S. and Mexican uh, cities. I know the El, Sal, uh, uh, El Paso and Juarez. Mm-hmm. Uh, they are a pair. Now, if you had more industry there on both sides, you don't really, have, from what I remember, you didn't have really much industry in El Paso, mm-hmm. but you could. And you could all along the border out to California, and you can be creating, bringing back jobs from overseas, from China. You'd be creating uh, cars. This is what GM does. If you look at GM, they're in Canada, they're in the United States, they're in Mexico. They're all over the place. And that's the government's now, right? I mean, very close relationship with the government. We can go in there and create uh, industry and manufacturing. Like I say, these people are very talented. They manufacture a lot of things, including cars, cameras, computers. There's no problem with that. They need to kind of reorient their uh, their economy, and we should integrate ours with them, right. and we can have a great future. That that leads to another issue involving the economy, which is tariffs. I want to get into that when we return. We'll okay. also take a call from Mike in Farmington and anybody else who wants to contribute, 651-989-5855. Closing argument. Steve Carlson in studio with us, candidate for U.S. Senate running as a Democrat. My name is Walter Hudson, TwinCitiesNewsTalk.com. You know, I, I went to Minnehaha Academy. I got a scholarship there when I was a kid, you know. And I've always been involved in these theological kind of philosophical good, good, and I wouldn't say good and evil, but good, you know, arguments about the, the possible and the good, you know. Ever since I was a teenager, I would meet kids and we would talk about that. And I feel like we're still talking about it. I think that's very positive. I think we need a lot more of that in Washington uh, to break open some of the thoughts like you've been bringing up. You know, I mean, we need more libertarian thoughts in Washington. We do. But they, they don't need to be like just Rand Paul talking about the evil of the Fed. That's that's one one issue. But all these issues require liberty. And what do we mean by liberty and what's the proper role? And, of course, these, these are kind of moral issues that have to do with diversity and difference. And they're very important, too. You know, I wrote the cultural pluralism requirement for the University of Minnesota. You know what that is? Before you would graduate from CLA, you would have to take two courses. They were they were quarters then in uh, African American studies, Chicano studies, American Indian studies, or Asia, East Asian studies. Finally, we threw in women's studies, which I shouldn't have done. But um, and some Indian and Chicano students were working really hard with me on that. And we passed it, and it went on for years. And so I really am interested in the history of all of these people. And unfortunately, the mass media and even the educational system, they don't get it. They don't get to it. And we need the professors to hammer it out. Like in this book, this uh, Schlesinger, he actually did an excellent job. The same year we passed that requirement is when he published that book, The Almanac of American History. There's a lot that can be done. That's why I get excited about it. You know, both education and uh, the political possibilities of, of serious discussion and learning. But of course, elections are notoriously not that, <laughs> especially now. They don't have serious discussion. You don't have your William F. Buckley's or, or people who kind of really try to take things apart. Things are coming too fast right now. I don't think Buckley could keep up with everything that's happening now. Well, nobody, yeah. It's... How come they, why do you keep turning my button off? Well, Just automatically. When we go to break, you know. Okay. But yeah, it's a bad situation right now. And our job is to make it better. And I think right here tonight, we are making it better. If you get people to listen to some of these things, and I would debate all of this with Amy Klobuchar. Uh, I've had debates with anybody who would debate. I've had a lot of debates. This is much less, you know, restrictive than the ones I've got in. You know, you have a lot of shouting and not much listening. Yeah. I try not to do that. Well, you have kind of a one-on-one format, too, which I think is is good. 
if you got people who actually, you know, are going to get into it, you know, get into the serious discussions. So how many kids you got? Both boys? Wow. Where do they go to school? Uh, they go to the St. Michael Abbeville School District. Um, one is third grade next year, and the other is uh, we're going to hold them hold them back to have them do a second year preschool before he goes to kindergarten. He's a June birthday, so. Oh. You know. So he gets a double yeah. education. So we're in City's News Talk, AM 1130, 103.5 FM, closing argument. My name's Walter Hudson, 651-989-5855, the number to join us this evening. We've got Steve Carlson in studio with us, candidate for U.S. Senate running as a Democrat with views very consistent with the current administration. He's a fan of Donald Trump by his own description. Let's talk to Mike in Farmington. Welcome to the program. We need two walls, huh? No, I, I hear you on that. Let's, let's let uh, Steve Carlson respond. I appreciate your call as always, Mike. Well, that was a uh, oxymoron, I believe, holding uh, failed states accountable. Uh, you can't hold a failed state accountable. And so, you know, a little bit of history, but ever since our beginning as a country, you know, people are talking about what a bad, bad guy we are. I don't think we are. 
Um, but we have been supporting democracy and, and democratic governments and independence from the other uh, Western powers throughout Latin America, throughout its history. So that's what we need to do. We need to build Mexico up. We need to build these other Central American uh, countries up. And I was going to mention my, my grandfather, uh, Douglas Henderson, actually was a, a matador in all of those countries and also a professional wrestler, a very colorful uh, life he had. So I have actually uh, relatives uh, in Mexico. Um, so I am totally relating to those people there and we need to help them so they're no longer um, a failed state. Now, every, mo apart from that, everything Mike said is obvious uh, and correct. And again, it's just like the immigration, uh, it's a so-called ban thing. We need to, people to calm down and quit using this as a rhetorical uh, device to drown out every, every, everybody else in the election with white noise during every election, which, by the way, you don't have debates. So all you have is all these screaming. So um, that's very well planned out by the Democrats. Uh, you have Keith Ellison doing it. You have Tom Perez doing it. They're trying to uh, destroy Donald Trump as if he and Melania are some kind of, you know, Boris and Natasha, you know, kind of a couple that skated in here. It's ridiculous. And these are important issues. And the Mexican people deserve our concern, not only at the border, not only the children, but all of them. Again, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo of 1848, which created that border, it's based on good neighbor relations. And that's what we must have. And so for people like Vicente uh, Fox to be coming out and, and saying, you know, F you or whatever to Trump, it's just ridiculous. Uh, and the same with, but, but they can't deal with Trump because they'll get undercut if they deal honorably with Trump. Too many people will undercut them in Mexico. They won't be president anymore. So we need to get, it's sort of like Kim Jong-un in a way. We've got to kind of get get along. All right, let's talk about dealing with other nations economically when we return. We'll talk about tariffs. Closing argument, my name is Walter Hudson. Steve Carlson in studio with us tonight, TwinCitiesNewsTalk.com. Well, you do push me into some positions, you know, which usually, you know, a lot of the online debate doesn't get you into. So it's, it, I really, you know, appreciate that because these things need to be developed, you know. And I'm going to have to go back and look at these things and, you know, make sure they're consistent with, you know, my values and plans and goals. But I think they are. But you almost have to kind of make, uh, I want to say improvise, but you've got to be kind of spontaneous in responding to some of these points, which aren't often brought up. People only talk about with each other what they agree with. So most of these things won't come out. So they're all, you know, maybe you're in that, in that group. I don't know. But you talk about all these things very extensively. And I, I admire that, getting very extensive into the questions. And I try to do the same thing, too. That's why I wish the noise would die down. A little bit and we could have serious talks yeah that would be nice it's a tall order nowadays but candidates find that just like a lawyer that don't put your person on this on the stand don't uh, deal with the issues that aren't going to benefit you and so they're not addressed and that's what government has to do and we have the best government possible to do that if we would just use it I feel something good is going to come out of these times, the more I think about it. Because we are going to survive, people are going to find out we're, we're good people, and we've got a good plan, and we're going to stick with it. And like Trump always says, you'll be very happy. It's actually true. People are being happier now. They're getting more jobs. Pretty soon they get better educations. See, that guy there was kind of, like you say, from a more conservative. I see those people. I listen to them, too. And I listen to the other. I follow reporters a lot. I follow all the national press. Before they report it in a, in a story, I always already see them talking about it. New York Times, Washington Post, anybody I can stand. Uh, Channel 4 blocks me. Pioneer Press blocks me. Because they get into these discussions and they can't handle it, you know? 
They can't take it that somebody might actually throw back at them an argument which might challenge them. You know, but you have to do that to keep people involved. It's part of the dialectic, isn't it? A, right. a genuine dialogue. We really need it. Who are you going to have tomorrow? I don't. I don't have a guest lined up for tomorrow. Don't some of these candidates want to come on, or don't they talk about these issues, like legislative races and stuff like that? I mean, we get we get our our share of people on, but you know, I I'd say half the guests we have either they ask to come on, or there's some other impetus, you know, like a conversation, like what we had. Yeah. You know. Well, I was thinking. I, I don't. I don't spend. I don't chase. Right. Guests for the most part because it's. I don't have time. Well, I was interested in coming on. Um, definitely. I was interested in coming on with uh, Tim Kinsley, too. Although Tim called me up. Can you believe this? I'm sitting there in the back of a Salvation Army van because I'm out bell ringing. I get a call from Tim Kinley. He says, we were just down at the court on this case with the Minnesota Voters Alliance, and everything that they talked about was your cases. Can you give me a list of your cases? Why are, Why is the Supreme Court in the... In, Ramsey County talking about your voting cases, you know. So, but still, uh, I like to talk with people who like to think. Uh, half of these people, if you'll say something, they'll look at you like, how could you possibly think that? It doesn't jive with my limited thinking, you know, what is politically correct. How dare you, you know? And we can have a democracy that's like that. I can stand their opinions. I don't want them to kill cops, but I'll I'll listen to a, a philosophical argument, you know, from them. I won't listen to their actions or their chants, you know. But I I want to I want to. This it's almost like psychotherapy sometimes. What is it that you actually have in your mind, you know? And with the left right now, the way it is, you almost need psychotherapy, you know. Um, and which I have a background in too. I mean, I've read books about it, you know. We're coming back. All right, so we've got Steve Carlson in studio with us tonight. He's a candidate for U.S. Senate running as a Democrat. And the reason, like the catalyst for bringing him in this evening was to talk about tariffs. That was the, the disagreement in the wake of our co-host, Bob Anderson, who is a candidate for U.S. Senate running as a Republican for the other seat that is up this year. The, the topic of tariffs came up during that conversation, and uh, Steve was listening. And started engaging me on social media, and that's why we have him in the studio tonight. So let's finally get around to it here on Closing Argument. My name is Walter Hudson, Twin Cities News Talk, and 1130-1035 FM. Catch us streaming at TwinCitiesNewsTalk.com and on your iHeartRadio app. We're here 9 to 11 weeknights, 651-989-5855, the number to join us. Brad Omlin taking those calls and producing the show. So, you know, my take on tariffs in a nutshell is that they are inherently and always consistently economically destructive because what they do is they they disrupt the process of a a buyer trying to seek the highest value at the lowest cost in the market that there is no scenario whereby adding a tariff to a transaction which is a tax adding a tax to a transaction adds value to that transaction and therefore the idea that we're somehow going to tax ourselves to prosperity in, in the form of tariffs is inherently flawed. Your response to that, Steve Carl? Well, um, I think the idea that uh, tariffs are never valuable is, is just historically wrong. Uh, 
Now, what you're talking about is something you know, people will always say smoot holly, you know, in, in those sentences. And they're talking about the 1930s. But if you look at the beginning of our country, well, first of all, the tariffs funded the federal government, basically, instead of the income tax until 1917. Just just to pause to on that point, because I think it's that's a, a totally legitimate statement. However, I think a distinction that we need to make is the tariffs that funded the federal government were universal tariffs. So they, they, it was a tariff on everything that came into the country mm -hmm. at a certain rate for the explicit purpose of funding the federal government. They weren't targeted tariffs meant to protect particular industries such as the ones we're considering. And I don't, I don't think that's what Trump is trying to do. Trump is trying to get, in fact, he offered that everybody would drop their tariffs. But if you look back at the history again, you know, I did mention in 1917, and, and I was surprised to see that uh, when, I, when I looked it up last year. But um, the, first of all is protectionism. Now, this country was founded on protectionism. If you look at the extremely rapid economic growth of both the United States and actually Britain at the time that our colonies were founded, a lot of it was attributable to the Industrial Revolution. But that, that happened with the extreme protectionism. Where it comes from is the Brit, Britain government did not even allow us to make our own shoes. They would not allow us to ship our products to them or any other country uh, in our own ships because they wanted their British subjects to make shoes, to sell to everybody with the new technology that made really good shoes, and to build ships. But, I mean, it sounds like mm -hmm. what, what you're actually saying is that we rebelled against the protectionism of the British. No, well, we, we had a war over that, but both countries exploded economically. That's my point. My point is that we had amazing economic growth during that time. And so you have to go back and say, well, why did we have that? And so what you're looking at is this really an ideological argument with certain industries who feel like they're hit um, by, uh, like you say, uh, well, they're, they're hit by the trade war kind of, you know, a scenario. I'm not saying that they, it happens all the time that there's trade wars whenever there's a tariff. But you're right, from a, from a strictly, uh, you know, rational, uh, classical economics point of view, you know, it's going to be an added cost and then it's going to be passed on to the consumer. And so why would you do that? So I appreciate you acknowledging that. Yeah. But you obviously believe that under certain circumstances, it's nonetheless the right thing well, to do. So describe those circumstances. Well, for instance, you don't want to lose whole industries. Okay. So even though you might say there's a greater value to some set of consumers because uh, you've had this also perfect you know, classical economics, which you never really have. That's always a, you know, it's never perfect. There's never perfect uh, knowledge of any, any of the economic players. They, they don't know what the best prices are. They, they're basically engaged in economic activity. You, you, the, the, the good thing about the classical economics, you want to give people a chance to change their choices if it will benefit them. And I think isn't that that's, isn't that chance only available with the choice? No, I think it's always available. I think everybody always has choices, and so but that's. You, but you're talking about taking away the choice by imposing a, a tariff, imposing a government restriction. You, or, you're not taking it away, but I do think that it can be affected, and we don't want that. We don't want uh, if our farmers want to sell to China, we want them to be able to do that, and I think Trump wants that too. Um, the big thing that's coming up now is the national security, okay? We were in a, before they made that new budget deal, you know, after the debacle of the financial cliff and the, uh, the, uh, the shutdown of the government, mm -hmm. um, and then Trump made a big, massive deal on the budget, which funded our defense, funded our military, because it was being held hostage by these politics. Um, so that's a very good thing. Um, but before that, we were losing control of our ability to set prices for steel and aluminum uh, as we have this buildup of the military, which we have and we're, we're going to have. But um, and, and we also can will need that to produce more cars. So, uh, you know, and, and ex for export and for use here at home. And so we need the uh, we need the steel. We need to take the iron ore out of you know northern Minnesota, we have plants that are shut down. I mean, if you're looking at the effect of uh, 
protectionism. I mean, look at northern Minnesota. Uh, what's that all about? It's it's about basically another country like China coming in and and dominating not just the U.S. commodities market for iron ore and copper, but the whole world. So let, and so explore, we're at their mercy. Let's explore that a little bit. Sure. Because when you talk about China dominating the market on something like steel or aluminum, there's a reason for that, right? Like the reason people would choose to import their steel from China is again, because they're seeking the highest value at the lowest cost. So isn't that good? Like if, you, if your concern is national security and you want to be able to build up the military infrastructure of the United States in as efficient a manner as possible and get the most bang for your buck, wouldn't you want to get the lowest priced, highest quality steel available on the global market rather than just restrict it to what you can produce domestically? Absolutely. I was looking at the other end of the production where people are taking all the ore. So the first time I became uh, aware of China's massiveness when I was looking at like Australia and they were buying up all of their commodities, they're buying up all of our commodities because they have a massive engine. Now, as far as steel production, the problem we've had with steel production is that we had the old style factories and foundries. And so that's what shut our iron ore down, is the other countries uh, were able to produce steel much more efficiently because they had more modern plants, had smaller plants, and we want those too. And now we need to get those. We don't want just to use the iron ore, but we don't want to be inefficient well, for our military. No. You're, you're a market guy, as I can discern from some of the things you've said. Right. What is it that motivates a business to improve its processes? Isn't it competition? You know, if, if, if you look at World War II, um, that was one of the greatest uh, engines for economic growth in our history. So we need, to, we need to go into more wars? No, <laughs> but, no but we people got to get serious. And, and, and we knew that they weren't always the, the cheapest prices. The thing about World War II production is quality control. Mm -hmm. It was amazing quality control. You've heard of, you know, built-in obsolescence. They were building cars that never broke down. So they couldn't sell any cars. And, and so... We need to have uh, that kind of quality, and that's going to make our goods more competitive. These things you can't control, like you say, they're, they're, they're controlled by market forces. But, but this, this is this is, and we, we do have to go to a break. Sure. But in, in as concise a manner as you can address this, sure. this would be my my question in response to that. How are you going to get there? How are you going to improve quality by eliminating foreign competition? Because that's the that's what a tariff is for, right? Like the whole no. purpose of it is to neutralize the foreign competition so that you can make the domestic production viable. Okay, let me just address that. If you look at our, our farms, now if we go into this tariff situation more deeply, our farming can be uh, hit. But we have always had subsidies, and essentially tariffs and subsidies are the same thing, to help our farmers so they don't we don't lose them. So and we protect them against erosion, drought, and also changes in the market. And, and that's a helpful thing. Um, it doesn't mean we don't want them to be the best possible farmers, but it means we recognize that these are important national resources. Steel is just as food is, and we've got to protect that. And that's what I see Trump doing. And because we haven't protected it, here in Minnesota, we've just lost massive jobs. And we can't have this. We've gone through the steel industry getting uh, beat out by foreign competition, and now auto industry and the people in the iron range are in trouble. And that you heard that when Trump came, they yeah, know they are very grateful to and so am I. the protectionism that they are. Enjoying. Not protectionism, but well, the attention. I, they're not. How are they being protected? Because uh, what's the point of doing the tariff? If it's, I mean, you just talked about jobs. Yeah, that isn't it. Are, isn't a tariff meant to provide jobs for a particular industry isn't that in here isn't that what protection is I, I i don't think i don't think so i think it's just to make sure you have an industry what britain was concerned about is they couldn't have a shipbuilding industry which they used to beat the spanish armada it was very key to their national security and they did not want to let it get away we need to also protect ourselves and this isn't all going to be about tariffs we want fair trade 
and we also want national security. So I think that that there's a basket of not deplorables, but good economic policies coming out of, <laughs> out of Donald Trump. Steve Carlson, Democratic candidate for U.S. Senate. We'll uh, wrap this up when we return. Twin Cities News Talk, AM 1130, 103.5 FM, Talk.com. Man, I, think, I feel like I'm over in the corner getting worked over. Man. <laughs> no, it's great. I love it. I love it. I don't. I don't meet too many people who can who can do that. You're you're very astute, man, in just taking arguments and and making good questions and arguments. I noticed that about your writing. You know, the further you go, you, you still think clearly. There's so many people that. I mean, that's very unusual. I wish it wasn't. <laughs> I really do. What we need is more media. We need more new media for, for people like you that can, you know, get people involved. Yeah. You know. So you don't you don't have a what do you call it, a podcast? You don't have a podcast. Huh? Well, we podcast the show. Okay. Okay. That's well, great. You know, it's I don't got time to be producing stuff outside of this. I mean, I my day, like tomorrow morning, I so we're done at 11. If I'm lucky, I'll be home like 10 minutes before midnight. I got to take a shower, get ready to, you know, put fuel in the van, and get ready for tomorrow morning, which will start at like 6, quarter to 7. Why? Because I, I have a day job. Oh, yeah. What's that? I do courier work, which is 9, 10, 11, 12 hours a day. Keeps in shape, though. Well, it's, so more, far. it's more driving than walking. Oh, yeah. But, you know, so my day is da dawn till dusk and beyond. You remind me a little bit of this Bradley Dean. Not that you, your politics are the same. Oh, I know what you're talking but about. But he works like, I think he worked at the airport, you know, doing this real, and then he had these uh, really good uh, news productions, I mean, from his, for his, his, uh, you know, You're talking about the religious guy. Yeah. yeah, I saw him out at the airport once. I was working on a jetway, yeah. and I didn't quite recognize him. But that's good. I mean, this Whatever is happened to him. He kind of disappeared. I think he's been going through some changes. I can't quite. At first, I thought, well, maybe somebody took over his account and was hacking it. You know, maybe that did happen. But also, they put you in jail. You know, they put you in Facebook jail, uh -huh. like they did with they. They they shut me off for about twelve hours at a time. Really? Twitter, Twitter. Yeah, you'll tweet something and all of a sudden right away, oh, you violated the safety code, you know, and uh, you can't get back on until twelve. Push this button to start your twelve hours. Bradley Dean Smith. Yeah, I'm he's a musician him. too. Yeah, I'm still friends with him. Yeah, okay. But I don't see. Let's see. Yeah, he's posting stuff. Yeah. I wonder why I don't see it in my thread. Yeah, that's another issue. No, I follow conservatives because I like clear thinking. I think the problem with many conservatives is they don't go far enough. They don't. They don't want to hear about the problems that they can't solve. You know. Maybe he moved because he's, he's North Carolina be, or something. No, he's he's going to be in in Wisconsin at a church in Amory, which I don't I don't know where Amory, Wisconsin is. Um. But on this coming Thursday, he's going to be at a church in Wisconsin. So maybe he moved to Wisconsin. See, I always felt that being a Christian made you a lot smarter. I don't know why, but I think it was always because you're looking for God's handy, handiwork for the creation and order and try to kind of understand. It. Whereas people don't believe in that. I don't know. They kind of believe in just luck, you know, and it doesn't do much for intellectual development, you know. So I think a lot of the great thinkers have always been people who had faith. Even, uh, what's his name, uh, the great philosopher, uh, Charles Sanders Pierce, in his last days, you know, he became a very intense uh, Christian believer in universal love and everything, even though he was a, a philosopher, you know, raised in a scientific laboratory, you know. You ever heard of him? A very interesting guy. That's a guy worth reading. He's Amer America's preeminent philosopher, according to Noam Chomsky. See, I even listened to no I met Noam Chomsky. I talked with Noam Chomsky. You know, I was going to go out there and study, and Professor Chomsky said, you do know that I teach linguistics, don't you? I said, yes. He thought I was, 
I was just interested in his politics, you know, because mm. I, I would go and listen to him, you know. He's getting kind of old. I like him. Um, he's very interesting. He, he's uh, deep into Israel, you know, and he's kind of a liberal, I guess, over there, but he's really deep thinker, you know. Yeah, like maybe four minutes, three minutes. Okay, minutes. whatever, man. I've enjoyed it. Thank you. Short segment on our way out this evening with Steve Carlson in studio, U.S. Senate candidate running as a Democrat. My name is Walter Hudson. Closing argument, Twin Cities News Talk, AM 1130, 103.5 FM. We got Barry in St. Paul on the line who has a comment for Steve Carlson. Welcome to the program. Appreciate the uh, thought, Barry. I, I that resonates with me. I mean, one of the arguments in favor of tariffs that I've heard quite a bit from callers and from other sources doing research for the show is as a reaction to the encroachments by other nations. So people will talk about the slave labor in China. They'll talk about the the flooding of the market with uh, with steel or whatever the case may be. All these manipulations that other governments do, which the premise there seems to be that when government involves itself in the market, it's bad. So why then would the answer to that be our government involving itself in the market? Yeah, I, but, I'm sorry. Yeah, I felt that uh, what Barry was saying was that uh, he thinks that tariffs make the government grow bigger. And I would, I would focus on that too. Yes, I have since, 2010, uh, the, the Move America Forward Act that I proposed was to shrink the federal government. We got to reduce the federal government. We've got to shift the power and the resources. All those areas that the Congress has preempted and taken away from the states have to be reduced and given back to Minnesota. I guess what we get like 78% of the money that we send to Washington, we get we get back to the state in, in some form. We've got to keep that money here. So we don't want tariffs to uh, grow um, the government. And I, I don't know, um, usually I guess those companies are probably based in some state and they can get a lot of the um, revenue from it. And I think that's very good. They, they have more of a business and they get more money back. I think that's great. Speaking of federalism, mm -hmm. one of the reasons why we have a federal government, one of the reasons why the several states at the outset, at the founding, decided that it'd be a good idea to come together and create a compact between them, which became eventually the Constitution of the United States, was in order to regulate commerce. And of course, that term regulate commerce is something that in the modern context means something very different from what it did at the outset. At the outset, it just meant to make commerce regular. And part of that meant not having tariffs and other economic restrictions between the states. Isn't that in admission, just the fact that we have that compact and in, in indication that there's value there in being able to treat trade freely over, over political boundaries? You know, it, that's certainly true. And we want that with with the uh, European Union and we want that with all of our partners. And I think that is why we want fair trade. We, we would like to eliminate those tariffs. Now, the, the exception is a national security right now. But obviously, yes, uh, we want trade uh, with Mexico, that's what we need with Mexico. We need trade with, with China. We need trade with Europe, uh, with Russia. Russia should be back uh, in, in the G8. And yes, that's what we want. We want to spread that opportunity to the Middle East. 
where they can diversify their economies. Do you have a website that people can check out? Yes, Steve Carlson uh, for USSenate2018.com. Thank you. Steve Carlson has been our studio, our guest in studio tonight. Closing argument. My name is Walter Hudson. Check us out tomorrow, 9 to 11 weeknights. Glenn Beck is next. TwinCitiesNewsTalk.com. Wow, Glenn Beck. Wow, that was really great. I appreciate that. Yeah. That was fun.